Hello, everyone, and welcome to DOD's first Joint AI Symposium. And I want to give a big shout out to the Joint AI Center for pulling everyone together that shares a passion that goes very deep for me, and that's making artificial intelligence real for this department. I'm sure there's going to be so much that you're going to discuss from mission areas that can benefit by bringing AI to the operational edge, to things that may not, maybe aren't in the limelight, but that certainly need the power of data analytics like logistics and business operations for the department. I know you're gonna be covering things soup to nuts, but what I wanna go through is the history of making AI real in the department and why we have had such a difficult time doing it and why I'm excited that we're finally about to turn the page, flip the script, and bring AI to the edge where our operators desperately need it. You know, the journey for me starts almost five years ago when I was pitching a project called Maven to then Deputy Secretary Work. And I had to include a tutorial in the upfront pitch that walked through machine learning and why it was different than the automatic target recognition programs that the department had pursued in the past. And it's amazing that the department has come in five years from having to get a tutorial on machine learning to having a broad knowledge of it across different echelons of leadership all the way down to the operators at the edge, but we still don't have anything to show for it at scale. So I remember giving that briefing, having to walk through how, how data, connected data, was the thing that changed the ability for us to do what we called automatic target recognition and now what we simply just call AI or machine learning or computer vision why that enabled it in a way that was fundamentally different than the closed form solutions of the past. Certainly processing and compute and storage have gotten much smaller, much cheaper, and much faster. And so churning through lots of connected data is simply not a hard problem anymore. And though there's a lot of interesting math to do to determine how to connect that data, how to extract features from it, those problems are being solved not on our nickel, by significant investment in the private sector, driven by companies like Google and Amazon and Facebook. So all the department really had to do was uh, paddle ahead on its surfboard and ride the wave if we had the vision to do it before it was too late. And so that project was approved and you all know the path that happened with MAVEN. The amazing partnership that we developed with USDI, with our intelligence arm of the Defense Department, uh, but ultimately led in our industry partner not being sure if they wanted to work with us long term. And I think that sullied AI in the department. It was viewed as something too hard, too difficult, uh, without the connection to external expertise that we would need to get it over the goal line. But I've never found that to be the case. Even in companies that initially said, we're not so sure if our workforce really wants to work with the Department of Defense, I never found that opinion to persist for long, especially once we explain the benefits that AI will bring, not just in making our force more effective, but allowing us to operate more safely, limiting the casualties that occur on the battlefield, especially those that, that we don't intend with, with innocent bystanders, the ability for algorithms and the data that support them to make the necessary side of warfare safer and better is something that we didn't clearly articulate. We didn't talk about the myriad missions outside of the pointy edge of the spear that could benefit. The disaster relief operations that we do every year during hurricane season and things unforeseen, where we're looking for victims, trying to work logistics and supply. It's a data heavy, a data rich environment and AI can help us churn through it seamlessly or go back to the bread and butter of what makes the Air Force and all of our services great, our logistics enterprise that is able to move mountains, moving uh, fuel and supplies from, from the U.S. to overseas, able to stand up operating bases in weeks and supporting operations from them for years. That amazing logistics enterprise could certainly benefit from data analytics that would help us to optimize things at a macro level and at a micro level. And if you think about those different missions, they dovetail very nicely with initiatives that are going on in commercial industry. 
So we didn't do a great job of articulating the broad value proposition the department would get if we were able to bring AI into the service at a level that is at scale. So shame on us, but I think we're doing a lot better now. And what's been amazing, uh, a, a windfall of COVID-19 and every dark cloud has a silver lining, is that those AI companies, those same ones that were thinking about Maven five years ago have been right on the front lines with us helping our commanders deal with the impact of COVID-19. We have seen a huge outreach wanting to work with us beyond just COVID-19 and disaster relief. And I think our military mission is, is certainly uh, trending up in how it's viewed in this nation and around the world, and it should be. Uh, we're a great partner with our allies and friends. Uh, we work with other militaries to help them operate better, and we provide valuable services uh, in disasters and, and when the world needs us most. And we haven't done the best job of sharing that as the brand we are outside of the amazing lethal force as well. But that has not been the major impediment to making AI real. Even if we had done the greatest marketing job in the world, had led with our value proposition, had led with our people, had demystified what we wanted to do with trained data and the algorithms that operate on top of it, even if we had clarified all of that, AI still wouldn't be real today because we jumped to the end of the story. MAVEN was meant to be a teaser, an appetizer, something to, to wet the department's palate for more. But unfortunately, we stayed focused on it because to really make AI real, you have to do a lot of work that is not the glitzy algorithms doing cool things at the edge. You have to lay in the infrastructure. And when I worked at the Strategic Capabilities Office, and my job was to do prototypes, examples that could help a service see how to envision itself and the future of warfare differently. But I didn't have the bandwidth, horsepower, or team to lay in foundational infrastructure for any service, much less the department. So it's been super awesome transitioning from that job to being the service acquisition executive for the Air Force and the Space Force and being able to take on the infrastructure challenge. It is not sexy, it is not glorious, and if you happen to be someone who works in this type of field for my services or any others, I want to make it sexy and glorious. Infrastructure is no longer a business system. Infrastructure is a war fighting system. And if we don't treat our digital infrastructure, our IT, as a war fighting system in this decade, we will lose to adversaries who do. So infrastructure is a broad word. It's an oft touted word when you want to refer to a whole bunch of technical things, but you don't actually want to list them in a paper, a PowerPoint slide, or a talk like this one. But I want to list them. I want to go through them and talk about what I am trying to achieve within the Air Force and Space Force and what I think the department as a whole will need. And if we work on this together, we shouldn't be working in isolation on AI. One service's step forward is a step forward for all if we get it right. But we have to overcome historical stovepipes that often lower our punching power and our purchasing power. So it all starts with a foundational layer of cloud, oft touted in the department, but we really haven't had enterprise cloud in the Air Force and Space Force until recently. We awarded a contract for Cloud One, which is a hybrid cloud that two vendors provide. And it's the first example, at least that I've seen, of having something that is truly enterprise-wide with hundreds of thousands of airmen operating on it to get their email and other necessary data to do both their personal lives and their military lives. And of course, once you have that kind of enterprise level approach to accessing computers and memory remotely, it naturally tees up the question of what else. If we're just using it for email and travel and things of that nature, we are far underselling its value. There is a reason why cloud was such a game changer in commercial industry. There is a reason why cloud naturally rose up from internet companies 
who simply couldn't update their search engines fast enough to keep up with their competitors. They couldn't have the computers all around the edge anymore. They had to push it all to the center so that it was mu used more efficiently, so it was used more impactfully. That's how cloud was born. It was born to generate software faster. And so that's the first transition from having enterprise-wide cloud that our department and all of our services will need to make. If you have enterprise cloud, that's wonderful. But if you don't have an enterprise-wide platform to develop code better and faster, you simply won't unlock its full potential. Even if you have all of the data in the world there, you won't unlock its full potential because you haven't put in the software development backbone that's needed to fully exploit it. So in addition to our enterprise-wide cloud, Cloud One, we created an enterprise-wide platform called Platform One. You can see the naming convention we're going with, which is the first containerized, fully Kubernetes-based software development environment that meets the DOD's DevSecOps uh, requirements. So it brings in this amazing technology also pioneered by commercial industry called containerization or Kubernetes, which is the orchestration of those containers, which really allows all the necessary functions of software to be bundled in the software itself. It makes it independent and isolated from the local uh, runtime, the local computer on which it's actually going to operate by providing the things that operating systems and applications typically require of the code itself. It's an amazing technology. It solves a monumental problem for us. And that's the ability to know your code is going to run at the edge safely. Well, our edge, those are fighters, those are bombers, those are satellites, those are tanks, those are ships. That's where the code really matters. And historically, we haven't been able to push the code seamlessly to it. Well, you can imagine why commercial industry wants to solve this. In the next wave of the Internet of Things, more and more things at the commercial edge are going to have safety critical functions. Flying drones, self-driving or partially self-driving vehicles are going to be things that people put their lives in their hands or at least their safety. And so knowing that code is going to run there without crashing, that could not be a more important problem for commercial industry to solve and they're solving it for us. So bringing that into the Air Force and Space Force, putting that into the enterprise-wide platform doesn't just give us cloud, it unlocks the ability to do software enterprise-wide, but push it to the edge in real time. Just like downloading code on the matrix, we should be able to download code directly onto a jet uh, and know that it's going to work without fail. And maybe in future, in a sci-fi future that we're not uh, to yet, maybe download it into our brains eventually. So that's platform. That provides enterprise-wide code development so we can generate software as fast as warfighters need it. Well, what would you want to do if you had enterprise-wide platform? You'd want to have enterprise-wide access to data on top of it, and we're working that now. I haven't got it as fully fleshed out as Platform One, but Data One is coming in to being thanks to some amazing work by our space professionals and acquisition who have been championing enterprise-wide data management through our software factory called Kobayashi Maru, the space uh, equivalent of Kessel Run. And they've done amazing work bringing data and coupling it directly to a software development platform. Well, now you can see how the story's starting to come together. So I have enterprise-wide cloud. I can access computer and, st and storage from anywhere, given connectivity. I have the ability to develop software in that cloud and push it to anywhere seamlessly. And now that software has access to data on top of it. Well, now we're ready to do those exciting enterprise-wide AI functions that were originally envisioned when Maven first kicked off. Once you have enterprise-wide cloud, platform, and data all managed as a service, now you can do data analytics as a service, AI as a service, not just used by one platform or one different group of operators, but used by all. Now there's more complexity to this. We certainly have to solve the global versus local problem. How much cloud at the edge? How much cloud do we want to have globally? How do we ensure that our platforms can connect to it? Because the second that we have this powerful AI engine 
Adversaries are going to do their darndest to disconnect it, to disconnect us from it. So there are problems to solve, but the exciting thing is that within the Air Force and Space Force, we are close to having that enterprise-wide infrastructure that will make AI at scale possible. So I'm super excited to partner with the Jake on that final layer, AI as a service. I may call it smart one, since everything in this stack has one at the end of it. Uh, it makes it easier for people to remember because in the world of IT, remember what we're struggling with. It's getting it funded. And that's not just true of my services. That's true of everyone in the department. You can't take a picture of IT. You can take a picture of airplanes and ships and tanks. So we've got an uphill battle to make this seem as important, as flashy, as sexy as the leading edge of war fighting. This is the leading edge of war fighting. It's the invisible power that will allow those physical things to, to dominate. So we've got an uphill battle to make sure that this remains funded. But, but once we have it, once we've got it funded and we give it a naming convention that, that people in the Pentagon can, can remember, now we can do interesting partnerships. And so for the Jake, for USD r &E, for the other services, we want to be able to lift and shift anything you're doing and drop it into our tech stack. We know we have to own that one layered tech stack from cloud all the way up to AI if we want to be able to certify it in real time with a continuous authority to operate. But if we're sharing the same development methodologies, there's no reason something developed by the Army or the Navy can't seamlessly go to our warfighters just as if an airman or space professional developed it themselves. That's the vision that we aspire to, is truly becoming an enterprise-wide software company that acts like a Google or an Amazon, that treats data like a Google or an Amazon. And I'm willing to predict that in future warfare, before a combatant commander counts the number of munitions or platforms that they would take into combat, they're first going to look at their digital infrastructure and data, knowing that if they are outclassed in those two facets, they will lose against an adversary that's faster. And let's talk beyond what happens once this tech stack's in place, once we have Cloud One and Platform One and Data One and Analytics One and Smart One and whatever other One features. The, the goal of naming it that way is to think of it as one system. One doesn't mean that there's not more than one competing option in that layer, but it means it enables all of our platforms, all of our systems to act as one thing, even if they were developed separately, just like the internet acts as one thing. So it's a powerful concept. So what happens if we get it right? Well, on the other side of this, there are going to be some significant operational challenges to work through. The OODA loop, Observe, Orient, Decide, Act, which is a famous concept in the Air Force, which really looks at how long it takes you to make a decision relative to your adversary. And the theory is that if your OODA loop is bigger than theirs, uh, that you'll lose. They're going to be more responsive. Even if you make one or two right choices, the ability to iterate, to learn, and to come back faster again and again ultimately allows that adversary to win. Well, up until now, humans have been in the OODA loop. Even for very quick decisions that have to be made in real time, people have been in the loop. But in a future AI fight, they won't be. There will be potentially millions of decisions made before a human gets any output of what's happened. So the operational impacts are huge. We can't just simply turn over AI to the warfighter and say there are risks associated with this. Hope you have a PhD in data analytics to understand them. We've got to design AI into our joint force so that the risks are understood. Things like Kubernetes and zero trust and uh, secure approaches to service mesh and microservices like Istio open up doors for us to design things safely, but we will have to get much, much better at digital technology for us to tell warfighters when they're safe and not safe using AI. Because aside from just designing it to operate securely, our adversaries are going to try to mess with it. It is fragile currently in the face of adversarial tactics because there's no money currently in hardening AI so that it can't be hacked or spoofed or otherwise meddled with. I think in future that will change. 
but we can't wait on that. The department cannot stand by and hope that hardened AI will just appear to us courtesy of the internet giants. But this is a wonderful opportunity for us to come to what we have seen as the output of COVID, partnering with the companies that work in this amazing innovative country to create that next generation of AI that makes not just the military, but the entire world safer and more secure. I'm excited that we've built a foundation that gives us the potential to create those partnerships, but we can't take our foot off the accelerator. We cannot have too many partnerships in this department. So if you're an AI expert and you have a grand vision or a grand design that is simply not getting out of the starting blocks, then come see me. We have to have our circle of friends be as broad as possible. And then we have to broaden our industry partnerships. Because this tightening of the OODA loop, where people are outside of decision making, where there will have to be understood operations that, that are more monitored rather than choreographed by operators, this may happen first for the military before it happens in the Internet of Things 2.0 or 3.0. So we've got to think ahead. We can't simply wait on technology to jump into our boat. But because a few have already, like cloud and platform containerization, we can get started much, much faster. So my question to the department, what are we waiting on? And the question to my services, at least I can say of the Air Force, you can't spell Air Force without AI. It's the first two letters in the name. Where is it? Let's make it real together.